Uh, what we're going to learn today is uh, one, one of the coolest story about, stories about Samir. He bought his own hotel at age 21. So he's going to tell us how he did that. And um, he also is, um, he taught, he is the one who shared with me about changing the, the book title to Wealth Beyond Money. So we'll talk about his thoughts behind that. He's going to tell, he owns in lots of investments. So um, he's going to tell you how to maximize your investments. And um, we're going to talk about the importance of having like a mastermind group or a peer group. So uh, just a little bit about Samir. Uh, he is the managing partner of Trophy Point Investment Group. Trophy Point is a private real estate lending firm that provides expedited loans and highest level of responsive service that serves a niche borrower market consisting of military officers and service academy graduates. So Samir graduated from West Point. Um, he served in Iraq and Afghanistan um, as an armored tanks officer. So Samir, thank you for your service. Um, he has experience, extensive experience in leading soldiers as he served as a combat platoon leader and a company commander. Um, so he's been involved in various forms of real estate over the past 15 years. Um, he bought his first hotel as a junior in college and he's been building his holdings ever since. He has also owned various operating companies with real estate, logistics, uh, multi-million dollar uh, businesses. And he is um, a, a professor, is that the right word? And, and a professor of entrepreneurship at Georgia State University. Um, I've had the pleasure of speaking to one of his classes as a, uh, as, as a guest, which was a lot of fun. Um, his, his students learn a lot from him and they love him. So he's doing a great job. So what he's going to talk to us today is like everything, entrepreneurship and like living your best life. Uh, Samir and I have been all over the world together. So we'll talk about some of those adventures and we're just going to drop nuggets of wisdom on you today so that you can learn and apply these things to your life and uh, just crush it like, like my man Samir here. So uh, Samir, what's up, man? How's it going? How you been? Hey, thanks for uh, having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So, uh, oh, somebody said best professor. Who's that? Yeah. D Dayal. What's up, Dayal? That's cool. Fantastic, man. You're getting props on here. I know. So, that's first good. of all, yeah. Uh, so, first of all, Samir, tell us. Uh, well, I, so this is what I wanted to share. Uh, so, when I when I was writing my book, I um, I didn't like write it in a silo. Like I have peer peer groups and people that I consult with who help shape my thoughts and things like that. And Samir is one of those people because I really highly value his opinion. So um, he was an early reviewer. He read an advanced copy of the book. I also consulted him about the title because Wealth Beyond Money was not the original title of the book. I think it was something like, it, it was like the six dimensions of success. Yeah, six dimensions of success, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that was the main title. And then it was how to achieve wealth beyond money or steps to wealth beyond money. And Samir immediately, he was like, and you need to flip it and call it Wealth Beyond Money. So tell me your thoughts be, be behind that and just what, what you were thinking about when you heard that. Yeah, I, you know, Ethan, I got to say the first thing I appreciate about you is that you are really good at building a tribe and building a movement around whatever you try to do. And I think one of the lessons that I learned very on about myself was that I'm like a lone solo operator and that doesn't work so well when you're trying to do big things so i i give mad props to you and i learned this from you that to always include people and to talk about what's going on with whatever project because you never know like what type of nugget someone will will provide or contribute and so my small contribution to your book was um we all get really wrapped up about money as entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and we like to focus on the dollar amount but we don't pay enough attention in my opinion to answering the question, what is it all for? Why right, are we doing yeah. this? Who are we doing it for? Why is this goal particularly important or meaningful to us? And we never really asked those questions. And so your book touched on all those elements. And I figured that is the real thing we should be, we should be conveying to the audience. Like it's about wealth beyond the money. And gotcha, uh, yeah. that's, that's where we're at. <laughs> yeah, man. I love it, man. And yeah, I get a lot, a lot of feedback on the title. People are like, Oh man, that's such a great title. And it's, um, you know, what's funny is like the book um, hitting the number one bestseller in the category of happiness. And really, that's what happiness is. It's about wealth, but beyond just the money. It's, it's, it's the health, it's the relationships, it's the, the adventure, the excitement, everything in life. That's what true wealth is, is to me. And, um, you know, I just I like how you flip it because so many people pursue who just think about money, money, money. And that used to be me, too. 
Um, and, and you know a lot about my backstory as well. And a lot of people get this tunnel vision about like, if I just get money, 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 I'll be happier. But yeah. that's not. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> it you think just because way. you have 100000 or a million dollars in your bank account that all of a sudden your problems will go away. Um, if right. anything, money magnifies your problems. Man, right. It, yeah, definitely. It can definitely complicate things. And I'll pin a link to the book. If you guys don't have the book yet, um, the easiest link, you can just go to ethansbook.com and I'll put it in the, uh, in the notes here. Or you can just go to the link in my bio. Um, I'm going to pin a comment. I'm going to hold down on it. I don't know. Okay. But um, so, Samir, I also want to know, um, being that you're a professor of, of entrepreneurship, and it's like entrepreneurship is cool now. It wasn't always cool yeah. back in the day, right? You just like, mean you're broke. Yeah, yeah. You're a brokepreneur, right? <laughs> yeah. um, it means you just couldn't get a job. You were unemployed. Um <laughs> I remember when I when I first decided I uh, said that I was gonna be a full time entrepreneur. My parents were like, "Like, are you are you sure? Are you crazy?" Like they were worried, but now it's like the cool thing to do. Um, so, what are some what are wanting to get in entrepreneurship? Um, what kind of um, false thinking do you see that the patterns with people? Yeah, I think there's two types of entrepreneurs. Ones that want are in it for the money, and we kind of talked about that earlier. And then the other entrepreneurs are there because they're very passionate about solving a particular problem. Um, and so that being said, the ones that succeed are the ones that are really good at identifying a problem, know all about the problem, know what type of people it'll help, and they start with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are the entrepreneurs that like that really get me excited because, especially in this day and age, the world is so complex that it's very hard to just put up a shingle now and just pretend that customers will come to you. It right. doesn't. It doesn't exist. That that may have existed in the past, but I don't think that exists now. Now people are so problem and solution oriented. You've got to be laser focused on solving a particular problem. And so when it comes to entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. One of the first things I teach in my course is, you know, one, know yourself, you know, and understand if you're the type of person to be, you know, willing to go, you know, be independent and work on work on a problem yourself. But then two is identify the problem, identify the market need, mm -hmm. and then assess yourself and what tools or network or contacts or whatever you have um, to see if you can go meet and solve that problem. Yeah, I like that. You got You got to be solving a problem. You got to there has to be a void, a need that you're fulfilling. It's not just like, oh, I'm going to go out here and, and hang my shingle and build it and make a ton of money. That's just not how it works. Um, yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. And people have, a, a lot of people have this misconception, and I want to share this with people too because we are on Instagram. And a lot of times on Instagram, you'll see people flashing like Lamborghinis and always on vacations and this and that. And they're talking about, uh, oh, I'm seven-figure entrepreneur, eight-figure entrepreneur. Um, and what – here's here's the misconception. God, you can, you can be a seven-figure, eight-figure entrepreneur. That really doesn't mean anything because you can be dead broke. You can be in debt. Look, I've been there. You, you can read in the book my own personal journey. I remember – because Samir and I are part of um, – we, we met through this organization – where the minimum requirement is that you have to have a business that does at least a million dollars in revenue every year. Um, and when I first joined, I, I had, had the million dollars in revenue, but I was actually, I spent more than that to make the million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so, so don't believe everything you see on IG. It, if somebody has a million dollar a year company, it doesn't mean that they are balling out of control. Um, if somebody has an eight figure company, man, they could be making twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year or or even worse, right? They could be about to go bankrupt. So um, you know, I just wanted to put that out there. It doesn't uh, you don't be fooled by um by appearances. Yeah, I mean I'll uh, same thing. Like we had I owned a logistics business, we had like almost nine million in revenue. Mm -hmm. And because at the time I wasn't really good at forecasting our cash, I found myself for several weeks like Payroll was about $100,000 a week. We only had $50,000 in the bank on Tuesday. Wow. <laughs> we're like various times we were at four $50,000 making payroll. And I had a $9 million revenue business at the time. And yeah. um, like you said, it's not about what you make. It's about what you keep.
That's right. That's right. And man, guys, it it's stressful. I mean, imagine, okay, it's Tuesday. You have half the money you need to make payroll by Friday. So the stress levels that entrepreneurs deal with, um, sometimes it's like we're way to the bank but a lot of times be like we're struggling on the inside because you you don't want to go tell your employees like hey you know I, I might not make payroll because that's their paychecks that that you're dealing with that you're responsible for and now the, that would scare the crap out of them because they got to put food on their table they got to pay their rent um so if you can't talk to them about it and like who, who do you talk to you, you can't most a lot of people can't talk to their parents about it maybe not their spouse so that's why you need connections like this you need um, a mastermind group, a forum, some type of um, uh, unit where you can actually comfortably, confidentially share these things and, and help each other grow as, um, as entrepreneurs or whatever you're doing. You know, it's not just about entrepreneurship, but I, I believe that you need a peer group to help you achieve whatever goals it is that, that you want to achieve. How'd you think? Yeah, I find, like EO has been transformational for me. Um, a lot of times entrepreneurs feel like they got to hold everything in and not share with people. But what EO has taught me is, you know, it's okay to talk about your problems. In fact, yeah. it's actually a good thing to talk about your problems because right. I remember I was talking to some random person about like, I need a new assistant basically. And she had no, like, I, she, I didn't know she was in business. I didn't really even know her. I was just telling her like, Hey, I've got this problem. I need a new assistant. Some things are going wrong. Um, mm -hmm. side of the house and um, lo and behold she like recommended somebody that you know is a pretty good candidate and you know we'll see where that person goes but I mean just to talk about my problem I immediately got a good candidate in the door whereas you know if you've done any real hiring you know that it costs five to ten grand to go find good candidates and here I was yeah. getting one for free um, yeah so yeah, for sure, man. You you just you, you can you can help you so much. That's the everybody's looking for a shortcut in life, and that's really yeah. the only shortcut you can have is to to leverage the experiences and the knowledge of other people in your network group. So, Samir, tell us um, how did you buy a hotel at age twenty one? That's that's what we want to know, man. That, that's a baller move. Yeah, well, I wish there was like a a grand vision that I had at age nineteen or twenty, saying I was going to buy a hotel, but um, like most things in life, it's kind of an accident. Um, mm. And so my story starts at West Point, actually. So I was at West Point. USAA Bank gives all the cadets a $30,000 loan at 1% mm. interest. This is 2007. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to pay it back until you commission as an officer. Mm. So you really get 18 months of free money. Wow. And, you know, I'm not really good at much, but one, one of the things I am good at is, is money and understanding the time value of money and how capital flows. Mm -hmm. And so I said to myself, $30,000, that's pretty good. I can go buy like a down payment. I can use it as a down payment on a townhome or something like that, thinking mm -hmm. I'll just rent it out. And, you know, we we're talking about our network. I started asking everybody, hey, I've got some money. I want to go buy a rental property in a good area. Do you have any ideas? And mm -hmm. I probably asked 100 plus people. And what ended up happening was somebody reached out and says, hey, I understand you're looking for real estate. There's this hotel for sale. The couple's mm. divorcing and they can't agree on much. And I think the judge is forcing them to kind of like keep moving forward. Would you want to go for this hotel? And I, you know, me being me, I was like, sure, why not? <laughs> not yeah. fully like what that actually meant. And then I talked to some more people in the business and I eventually found another investor that uh, co guaranteed the SBA loan and put up more of the cash. Um, I had some other cash from, from money that we stayed up for college. Um, we just put it all together. Um, okay. and we, wow. we you know, it was a days in hotel outside of, uh, Waukegan, Illinois. Um, wow. And, uh, we didn't make any money for five years after that. <laughs> oh, wow. Cause wow. I bought an 07 and then 08, 09 happened. And back then for hospitality and maybe even it's true today, success is defined by staying in business at mm. that time. And so we struggled very hard to stay in business. I used to give up my uh, military leave uh, three, four days or whatever and go up to the hotel and check on things and improve operations as I, 
as we progressed. The first dead body I ever saw was at the hotel before my uh, combat deployments, actually. <laughs> wow. You guys hear that? <laughs> wait, wait a minute. There's so much to unpack there. First of all, he said the first dead body he ever saw. Well, let, <laughs> let that sink in for a moment. But then it was at his hotel that he bought at age 21 man <laughs> yeah. can you tell us more about that about the dead body story yeah well you know unfortunately someone just overdosed on drugs and oh. she checked in um but she didn't check out and you know me being the hotel owner i i thought i'm there you know it's a random weekend i'm i'll go and knock on her door and see if she's okay and i knocked and uh um and this is this is literally like almost 12 i feel comfortable talking about it it. but like she um she like overdosed and i think uh and she died and, and uh in the honeymoon suite of all places Oof. wow yeah but she was alone i mean i don't, I, I don't want to be insensitive about it but like you know yeah. these sorts of things happen in in certain parts of america especially at a lower economy hotel like a days in i learned a lot, oh wow a lot like dealing with the police dealing with Corner, dealing with like the newspaper I tried very hard to like not make that the news of the you know the local paper um, yeah that sort of thing wow man that, that is crazy man Woo. okay so um, I, I want to know this share with everyone what you learned what are some of the most valuable lessons that you learned uh, serving for, uh, fighting for our country in Iraq and Af Afghanistan that you have applied to business? The biggest one is, is teamwork and mm -hmm. learning to build teams. Because I think in today's age, we're so, there's so much detail, so much noise, so much complexity, that expectations are higher of customers in any sort of industry you go into. And with that comes this, this notion that like, you cannot do it all. You can try to do it all yourself. And there are people, one in one million, that can pull that off. I'm not one of those people. And mm -hmm. the biggest thing I learned in the military was learning how to build teams and learning how to bring people into the fold and mobilize them to go achieve a common mission. Okay. And if you, yeah. can, if you have that skill alone, regardless of whatever industry you're in, if you have that skill alone, I think you'll go very far, regardless of your technical knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. If you guys have any questions for, for me or Samir, please drop them in the chat. Um, Killing all this is a super smart guy. He is a, a, he's an entrepreneur um, instructor at Georgia State University. And here you have free access to ask him anything you want. He also, you know, the, the thing about, and I've told you this before, Samir, um, you are a professor, but you actually have lots of real world experience. And I remember when I was in school, um, in art and design school, there were some of my instructors had no experience. Like they were just fresh out of college and then they started teaching. And then I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, you're, you're 25 years old and you're teaching me and here I am, um, you're not that far ahead of me. And I would like get the syllabus and study ahead and I, I ended up learning more than some of my instructors and ended up teaching them stuff I was like, wait, this doesn't add up because I'm, I'm paying, I'm, I'm accumulating all this student loan debt. And, um, but you are, you know, it, I feel like it's rare, maybe not anymore. You let me know. But I feel like it's rare when you have, you know, they have that saying, those who can't do teach, which I think is a little bit insulting to teachers, but there's maybe a nugget of truth in there. At least I experienced that. But you are the real deal. Like you have done it, you continue to do it and you teach it. Um, do you feel like, um, that, do you feel like you stand out amongst some of the other instructors and, in, and in delivering like different valuable lessons to your instructors because of that? Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. Um, I mean, I think the fellow instructors I work with, so George, so a big shout out to Georgia state. So they actually have a reverse model where they actually have professionals that actually work and run their own shops and their own, you know, investment firms to come and teach. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, as I've observed in education, um, I think instructors have like a lot of knowledge and I don't want to take away from that, but I think 
the reason why students gravitate toward me and the instructors with knowledge is because we also know how to sell. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to know everything under the sun. It's not enough to write a 150 page dissertation about some, some topic. It may be a very important topic, but if you don't know how to communicate that, you don't know how to relate to that, you don't know how to sell it um, to anybody, your message is not gonna go very far. And yeah. what my students appreciate about it, about me is that I take a lot of time to sell it to them in the sense of like helping them really understand and, and communicating the message in a way that they can appreciate it. Yeah. Um, because most students are not gonna be academics their entire lives, if, if ever, right? I mean, they may go get their bachelor's at most and then, you know, that's it. And so I take a lot of time to show them like what the real world looks like and how what, what's going on in the real world applies to their own world. And then give them a roadmap or a path to go from where they're at right now to eventually hit higher, higher heights later. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, and you're, you're a really good teacher, too, and your students uh, really love you, man, as you can see. I know some of them are on on this live. So um, it's really cool what you're doing, man. Not, there's nothing in the world more valuable than educators, whether it's in a formal sense or just educating people like we're doing now, just sharing stuff with the general public. No strings attached. You know, it's like, you know, I just want people to, to know. I mean, even with my book launch, man, I donated, donated all the proceeds to charity. It's not about making money. It's about sharing knowledge and helping someone else's life. Because so many people have done that for me. Like, complete strangers have, like, shared information that has transformed my life in major ways. So I believe that, you know, you pay it forward. And if each person does that, that helps just make the world a better place. Like, one share at a time, you know, one connection at a time. So something you did, and I want to be respectful of your time, but I want to um, acknowledge here that uh, Samir wrote a, uh, a blurb from my book here. He said, Ethan's well-written book highlights the most important mental constructs that will serve you extremely well, not just in business, but in life overall. Samir, he, he is in this book where he shares his thoughts and... Um, for those who don't know about what the six dimensions of success are, it's first, it, it's an acronym that spells simple. It's your spirituality, which is like your subconscious restructuring. Um, that's the S. The I is for your intellectual improvement. Um, M is for money mastery. So everything dealing with your career, your business, your finances falls under the category of money mastery. Your P is for your physical presence. That's your health. That is your... Um, uh, your your fitness, your the way you carry yourself, the way you dress inside and out, your nutrition, all of that. Um, L is for love and leadership, which anything dealing with your relationships falls under that bucket. And that can be your relationships um, with your family, your relationships with your spouse, with your coworkers, with your employees, with your peer groups, your social, all your relationships fall under the L category. And E is for entertaining experiences. Because you can have it all in all the other five areas, but you can be bored and depressed. Experiences, um, your recreation, your hobbies, your travel, whatever, whatever it is, you have to be very intentional about that. Acronym simple, S-I-M-P-L-E. Um, we go into it in, um, and again, it spells an acronym simple. I'm gonna go through it real quick with everybody again as they're rejoining. Um, the S is for your spirituality or your subconscious restructuring. So it's all about your, that's about your inner game. Um, and it doesn't really have to, anything to do with religion, but everything like stillness, uh, focus on the self, your meditation, all of that really is restructuring your subconscious. And then the I is for intellectual improvement. Every single day. Uh, is vitally important to success. And then uh, the M is for money mastery and everything dealing with your career, with your business, um, your per personal finances falls under the money mastery category. And then the P is for fits your physical presence. So that's your fitness, your nutrition, your health. It's also how you groom yourself and carry yourself and present yourself to the world um, from a physical point. And then L is from love and leadership. And that's all about your relationships with your family, with your spouse, your, your romantic partner, 
or partners and um, your children, all the different types of relationships, your coworkers, your, your employees. And um, lastly, E is for entertaining experiences because you can have it all in the other five areas, but you could be bored out of your mind. You could be depressed. We've seen this happen with people where they're just not getting enjoyment out of life. And I believe that you need to be very intentional about your recreation and your hobbies, your travel and things that you do. And um, so with that, I want to know, Samir, like, um, give us give us a snapshot. Because the thing about it, like, I don't believe in the traditional concept of life balance. Because if you think about balance, it's like a, a seesaw, right? In order for one side to be up, the other side has to be down. And I don't believe it has to be that way. Or at best, if you if you do achieve balance, then it's just average. It's just mediocre. Uh, but I believe that you can have it all in all six of those areas, um, but may, maybe not all at the same time. You have to go through constant calibration depending on what's going on in your life, like the, like the wings of an airplane. So what I encourage people to do in the book is to do an assessment like every day. Like where, here's a snapshot. Like how am I feeling today in the S category, in the I category, on a scale of one to ten? in the M category, in the P category, in the L category, in the E category. And wh where, where could I use some improvement? And just being aware of that will help you improve your life and calibrate your life um, for you know, ultimate happiness and success. So give us a snapshot. Like where are you feeling your best right now in those, in Samir, in those, uh, out of those six areas? Like where do you feel like you're crushing it at this moment in time? Yeah, so first of all, I'll say this, that I think you're absolutely right. It's not about necessarily like maximizing every single dimension every single day, but it is about improving incrementally right. in at least one or two of the dimensions as you can. And for me right now, I think money mastery has been pretty much on my mind, right? Like my fund has about 15 million of assets under management right now. I raise money from investors. Um, it's investor wow. money in the fund. Wow. And now I'm deploying their capital in some unique ways that allow them to have a great return that also allows me to pay, you know, pay myself a decent, decent amount as well. Um, awesome. And so, you know, in the past, it was more about physical stuff. It was more about personal stuff. But now for me, for me, thankfully, because, you know, I'm in a very special place right now with my family and like the way things are going, it's all about, you know, growing my business. Um, and I'm actually privileged to be able to do that because not many yeah. people, uh, the stars don't align that way for many people. And I know that when the stars do align, you got to go all in, in right. whatever venture or business. You're in. And so thankfully um, that's what I'm, that's what I'm about right now. Awesome, man. And you're, you're so right. Like when those windows of opportunity and you see that, you know, that cause they're not always going to be there. 